Tomorrow night is our second all-night prayer here in Singapore. And um, we will be actually teaching a series also in that all-night prayer. And uh, it will be a prayer series. And um, tomorrow uh, afternoon is our Saturday service. And uh, we will be, we have been touching on the relationship series which hasn't ended yet. But uh, I flow with the Spirit, and sometimes there's a burden of the Spirit to teach on a certain area. So tomorrow, Saturday afternoon, we will uh, sort of uh, uh, cut across the relationship series and hold it and teach a very short uh, testing, trials, and tribulation series. And then when that finishes, then continue on the relationship series. Uh, And that's for tomorrow. And tomorrow evening, we will start on... uh, an overnight series. We have done the introduction to all night prayer, but tomorrow night we will be touching on secrets to powerful prayer. And uh, it's different from a prayer series. Prayer series they teach about uh, how to pray and all that. But these are lessons that we have learned in which we learn to come before God and know that we can really pray through. So that we are starting a series on that in the all night series, which is a once a month. And uh, tonight is the last uh, of the exegetical series, and we just did a trial to see how each one of you would uh, enjoy a different type of uh, spiritual food in exegetical teaching. And uh, we'll do it from time to time, but uh, after completing the exegetical teaching tonight, we will be going on to a uh, Uh, new series the next fortnight which is on mysteries of creation mysteries of creation especially on the things that God has revealed from the spiritual world aspect and how it affects how we view our life on earth and it does affect many areas of our life how we look at our soul our spirit and even healing for example in terms of healing we always look at healing by itself. We want to be healed of this or that. Our finances, we think, or we want to do this need mad or that need mad. But from the spiritual world's perspective, it's not so much healing. It's not so much supply. It's more harmonizing with the laws of God. And whenever we are flowing in a harmony of spirit, soul, and body, and with the flow of the spiritual pattern and spiritual rivers that are being released from God, then all those things will come by itself. So it's a matter of staying true to the forces of the Spirit that God has released. Praise God. So tonight we will complete Philippians chapter 4. Let's go to God in prayer as we begin this series and uh, continue uh, from where we left off last night. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we praise you and thank you. We thank you, Father God, that the Word of God can be applied in so many ways. And there's such a richness of your Word. And as we look at this study and this series, and we realize that this is only one little book that we are looking at. Every single passage, every line, every dot, every tittle will not pass away. But every word of yours shall surely come to pass. But Jesus himself declared that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will not pass away. And even your old covenant declared that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, every single word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Father, help us to appreciate your word. Help us to Enjoy feasting upon your word. We know, Lord, as we grow in your word, we will be established in you. We ask especially tonight as we look into these passages that you would grant unto us afresh. Let the spirit of wisdom and revelation flow afresh upon each one of us. Grant that once again the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened. We may know the hope of your calling, the riches of your inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of your power towards us who believe. 
And we continue to draw the bloodline around this nation. And we continue to claim, Father, the book of Psalms 2, where you have said, ask for the nations, and you shall give it unto us. And we ask for this nation. And we thank you, Father, for the rule and reign of Jesus in this nation. And we proclaim the Lord Jesus and his name to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west. And we send forth, O oh God, the word of life in the Spirit. Even as we declare your word and preach your word in this place, let this word resound in the spiritual atmosphere above this nation. Let it resound to the north, to the south, and to the east, and to the west. And let all who are hungry, Lord, in the Spirit, pick it up in their spirit and be drawn unto a close walk with you. We thank you, Father, for your angels whom you have sent to work together with us. And once again, we establish the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. That everywhere where our foot tread on, Father, you give the land unto us. So we proclaim the Lordship of Jesus Christ over the length, the breadth, the boundaries of this nation. And we ask, O God, that the light that you gave unto us of the open heavens over us, that it would extend beyond the borders of this nation to all the surrounding nations. And we thank you, Father God, for Jesus Christ. And we ask, O oh Lord, that Jesus be lifted up in our midst. O oh Father, lift up Jesus high in our midst and cause Him to be seen in Him alone. Cause us to love Him afresh, Lord, with a fresh love tonight. Cause us to fall in love with Jesus all over again. Cause this freshness of the relationship that we have with You to flow from the heavens above. Tonight, Father, once again, let heaven touch the earth. Let our spirits, O oh Father God, be captured, be raptured into the richness of your spiritual word of life. Break down the bread of life unto us, Father God. And cause us to hear not just your teaching, but to hear your word, your voice speaking unto us. That you establish us in your word. And as we hear your word, heal your people, deliver your people, establish your people in the holiness and in the ways and the things of God. For all that you do, Father, we give you the glory, the worship, and the honor. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. And uh, we have read, I believe, Philippians chapter 4. Up to verse 9 yesterday, although we teach about right up to somewhere in verse 7. So if you don't mind tonight, let's read from uh, Philippians chapter 4. Let's start from verse 7 where we touch on part of it uh, right to the ending to make sure that we have read through and we have covered it. So Philippians 4 verse 7 onwards. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds to Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learn and receive and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly then now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lack opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, 
For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be a base and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you share in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, Paul says, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now, in verse 22, we know that Paul has been winning souls for Jesus. And so here, he has won a lot of the soldiers who were guarding him. Remember, he's writing this, and uh, he, is, he is still under guard, and he's still a prisoner. But he knew by the Spirit that he would be released. He's definitely converted all his guards too. And uh, yesterday night, we left off... Um, in uh, part of uh, verse 6 that we touch on. And then we were going to look at verse 7, which is a very powerful phrase here. And it says, And the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let's look at some of the Greek words found in um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. And we look at verse 7 here. The word peace, which is, uh, we seldom analyze the word peace because we know it's a Greek word, irene. And if your name is Irene, it's an English form of peace. Irene, or Irene, uh, English form, of make it into uh, Irene. Irene, uh, the word peace, if you look at our notes there on, uh, yes, that's the one that we're presenting that. Irene actually means to join. To join. That's interesting. How come it doesn't mean to be calm? To join. That's a root word of the word peace from the word airo. And I do know that in the Greek translation given to you, that uh, the form sometimes looks different. That's because uh, uh, they have the ending to add to the sentences. But the root form is uh, irene. So you would have, uh, yes, they do have irene too. Kai he irene too. Tu. So it says here, and the peace of God. And uh, sometimes the ending change uh, in its usage and what we list here is slightly differently spelled from the actual Greek text it's because we were just presenting the original Greek word. And original Greek words or root word usually is presented in what we call the nominative uh, tense. The, and so sometimes they use accusative tense or whatever tense they use. So happen to be the nominative tense. Hey, irene. But if you have been accusative, it will be ten ironen. Then you say, hey, the ending is ironen. How come it's ironen? And uh, so, in a root word, it's always given in the first case, which is a nominative case. But iro 
which is where they derive the word peace is interesting. There is no peace without being joined to something else. Even in a natural, when something is uh, calm or peaceful, it has to have an environment that produces that. Waters that are calm are because uh, the wind is all blocked up or the wind is not blowing or, uh, and uh, it's surrounded by, by protection. The waters become calm and it reflects the surrounding mountains or trees to produce a lovely scenery of peace. In the spirit, there is no peace without the Prince of Peace. There is no peace without the God of Peace. Even in a natural political arena, when we say the world is at peace, the world is at peace only because the strong nations do not make war. And when you have a good, strong countries that are uh, Benny Wallen, they are not countries that love to do all the wrong things or, or they are not tyrants or they are not uh, seeking to conquer and uh, take advantage of every, every other country and bully them around. Then you would have a warlike situation. So even in the natural world, peace is only possible when the strongest country determine, hey everyone, let's live in peace. But if the strongest country in the world or the, or the top three or four countries in the world says, okay, let's fight, every other country will be affected. Like the old Malay saying, Gaja bergado, tikos mati. Okay. When the elephants fight, all the mice die. <laughs> kung, kung, kung. Right. And... Uh, so we realize that there is always a fallback for something causing peace. Let's take the Roman Empire. There was a period of peace when the Roman Empire extended back in history. And for a moment there was peace. But before the peace there was a war. They were fighting who's going to be number one, who's going to be number one. Finally the number one is settled and everybody said, okay, you're number one. <laughs> and then everyone had peace. The same in the animal kingdom. If you suddenly release all the hundreds of dogs together and put them in one place, what will happen? The dogs will fight it up. And they will fight, they will bite, they will tear one another's ear off and they will injure one another until one dog emerge. And when one dog emerge and say, I'm the top dog! And all the dogs say, yes sir, you're the top dog. We are all junior dogs. Peace reigns. So anything the top dog says, all the other pack follows. Suddenly there's peace in the pack of dogs until another top dog wants to take over. Then they fight again. And then of course everybody gets injured along the way. Peace, if you look in a natural, in a spiritual it always rests upon something else. Peace in the animal kingdom is when the animal kingdom has settled the dispute who is number one. So they rely on the top dog. So uh, top dog number two, dog number three, dog number four say, hey, 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 they fight. Top dog comes, hey, shh, peace. Because the top dog says so. And uh, same in the world. In the spiritual realm, there is no peace possible until you're joined to something that settles you. What is stability? Let's suppose that the ground under us is unstable. You can't build a house because it's always unstable. But you build a house on solid ground. The ground must be solid enough and then you build a solid house, it won't shake and move. But if your living room were in a boat, it is subject to the waves. So we realize that even that, that calmness, that peace, we have to rest 
in the end, it's a rest on something solid. You have to be joined to the Prince of Peace to have peace. What an interesting thought. No, we never realize the simple word peace means join. Now you know why some people lose their peace. You lost your relationship with God. You get disjointed away from the Lord. You got occupied and then you forgot to maintain your relationship with the Lord. And then as you get disjointed, suddenly you find you got no more peace. Because peace comes when we are joined to the Lord. Simple little word, but there's a whole lot there. But that's not what we're teaching on. It's just one of the little words that I wanted to point out. Uh, simple things like that, that uh, the translators cannot bring forth, which is the reason for exodetical uh, teaching. Now, remember what we did, to, did in Philippians. We could do for every single book in the Bible. And so there's a whole lot of material that we just love to teach, but not enough people to listen to. I mean, oh my, if I say, well, the next time, you know, we're going to do like Paul. Say, like what? Paul in Ephesus. You know what Paul did? He, he preached day and night for three years in the school of Tyrannus. And there were a lot of hungry people. They just won the word of God. And uh, then you could cover uh, a lot of ground. So there's a lot of ground that we, we can cover. And uh, it's more and more people... Are hungry. So we, we are not going to go exegetical teaching all the time, you know, Sunday, Thursday, Friday, all night exegetical. You know, at the end of it, we got only one student who loves Greek and Hebrew. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So <laughs> I know <laughs> exegetical teaching is interesting, but not everybody can handle that. So you know, most people say, hey, a lot of topical teaching, right? Oh, we're going to mix once in a while. Once in a while, we cannot always be giving you milk. Uh, open your mouth. Uh, open your mouth. Once in a while, say, hey, come on, eat a bit of a chunk of steak. Yeah. So, exegetical teaching is like a chunk of steak. Uh, let's go to Philippians 4, uh, verse 7. The word surpasses here in the next word, which is, we are still in verse 7. The word surpass is an interesting word. In itself, uh, wow, suddenly it's very big there. <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. Surpass, have we got the word surpass? Uh, it's below, thank you. Next word, uh, surpasses, which is from the word hopeco. Now, surpass, you see, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. What do we mean by surpass? The root word surpass is from a combination of two Greek words, which I summarize in my sub-notes. From hupe, which means above, over, beyond, and from echo, which means to have or to hold. And you put the two together, you have hupeko. Hupeko. And uh, hupeko is uh, a combination of two words then how can they say surpass when there is a root word there that means to hold? To hold over. To hold beyond. To hold extensively. So here when you look at the uh, Philippians 4, 7, it says, the peace of God which can hold. It doesn't just surpasses your understanding. See, when you read surpass your understanding, this is what most of us think. The peace of God is on one side. Our understanding is on the other side. Blah, blah. So the peace of God, clear, clear. The mind on that side, blah, blah. You know? So the peace of God just goes, shoom. your understanding goes that way. The peace goes this way. It surpasses. It's just beyond. That's not what it means. The word surpasses means that the peace of God is actually holding all the bits of your understanding. It's not like your understanding flew away. Shoom, the peace come, your understanding go off, disappear. The peace is so powerful that it go over every single one of your thoughts. See, your thought can go in a hundred different directions. And then the peace of God comes and it holds 
every one of your thoughts in place. And it brings it into order. That's what it means by the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And the word mind is the normal Greek word news, which includes all the different Greek words for mind. It holds your dianoia. It holds your uh, dialogismos. It holds your phronio. It holds all the entomesis and all the different parts of your mind together. And it holds it in order and in perfect balance. That's powerful. That's powerful. It goes beyond all those things. See, that's what the translators couldn't translate. Just a simple word like surpasses, impossible to bring across. Because if you say, and let's say they try their best to translate in verse 7, and the peace of God which uh, holds all the understanding. There's no meaning. There's no more meaning in the English. We, we couldn't. Couldn't bring it across. Even the Amplified Bible struggles. Some people say, wow, uh, if exegesis is so good, that means the Amplified Bible must be good because Amplified Bible gives you all the variations of possible translation. But it's only the variations of the superficial level. It doesn't split the root word into two parts or three parts if it came for three parts. It doesn't dig into the historical origins of the word. As you all know, some of you are bilingual or trilingual or... Is there a quaringle? <laughs> quaringle? <laughs> Pentalingual? <laughs> and uh, as you all know, there are certain words in Chinese, in English or in Indian that are very hard to translate over. Because the root meaning carries a different, different thing all together. And uh, you, to translate it, you might need four or five descriptions instead of just one word. But in translating the Bible, can you imagine some of you say, why didn't the translators put all those things? Oh yeah, you're really suggesting it. If they put that and do everything, your Bible, which you think is that thick based on Indian paper, will be that thick. <laughs> so most of us say, hey, read your Bible. You look already don't want to read. <laughs> because your Bible will be the size of your Webster's Dictionary. I mean the original and the bridge one. <laughs> You take one look, oh, don't read. <laughs> My so they say, when in the world can I finish this? <laughs> so they couldn't, they couldn't translate, you know, each little word into, you know, four or five different uh, avenues. Uh, it would be too thick. Uh, they just had to try to convey as quickly as possible the points across to us. And it's interesting that, the, that, that peace is a holding peace. It holds everything together. So peace needs to come in. And verse 7, which uh, surpasses, as we know, his whole, all understanding. And then there's the other word. Will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That word guard, we definitely have to have a look. And uh, the next word is the word guard, which is where uh, we get the word uh, here. The word guard. <laughs> Yes, and uh, it says to keep, to guard, to keep in perfect peace in Philippians 4 verse 7. And here we got the word guard as the word uh, fro, florio, florio. It's a compound of two words. This is an interesting word. The word guard is a compound of these two words. And that compound, uh, in, together it can mean a watcher, mount guard, a sentinel watching over, uh, like post spies at gates, a figure ready to, to hem in, to protect, to keep, with a garrison. And so in the Amplified Translation, it says that the peace of God garrison your heart and mind. As you know, to garrison is like you build, you build a fortress around. Remember long ago, uh, before they invented aeroplanes and bombs and all that, that can, that, that, that can bypass all these solid uh, walls, 
And uh, long ago, when they fight with spears and swords and shields and arrows, they would build castles. Castles. Because the castles would prevent those, those uh, uh, spears and swords and arrows uh, from easily coming in. So they build those castles. So here, Garrison is like building the huge castle wall that is there. But more than that. More than that. It includes that, of course, but it's more than that. The original word, God, actually comes from two words. pro horau. Now, horau is a word that you have been taught before. Horau is the normal Greek word for vision or visualize. Vision in the Greek word in the Bible is horasis, from the word horal. And so here is the word horal, to see, to visualize. You see, how come the word see and the word pro become the word God? Well, this is a story in the Greek. What does a God do? What's a watch, watch, God, watch God do? He watches over. A watchman. He's supposed to watch. So you add the word pro, which is in front. So to God, that's how the origin mixture come. To God is actually to watch over. That's a God. See? So you're watching. <laughs> watching over. So that's what the God is. If you hire a God in your factory, in your office, or whatever, the God is not supposed to sleep, correct? They are supposed to be watching the building. Marching around, you know, right? Watching, watching the building, All right? That's what they're supposed to do. That's how the original word hora and pro come together. Pro means they're they are next to it, watching. And hora is their eyes are big, watching, <laughs> watching, you know? So they're not allowed to sleep. They're watching all the time. And that's the origin of the word, a watcher become God, become garrison in his usage in the Greek. But it's interesting that peace is doing that. He said, who is the one doing all these things? The peace of God. He said, what does peace do? Oh, peace watching you. Eyeball to eyeball. See, peace is watching, guarding over. Not just, it's, it's watching over every area of our life. The peace of God is a power force in itself. It will watch over us. And not only that, it includes the ability that it causes us to see into the spirit realm. That is why until everything within us is at peace, you can't see into the spiritual world. We did a teaching in the church camp one of the illustrations we use was how that inside each one of us, there is an ability to reflect the spiritual realm. Based on 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, which says that um, um, as we behold Him, we are being transformed from glory to glory. And it tells us how that uh, as we behold the Lord as in a mirror, we mirror the Lord inside us. And so there's something inside us that mirror. And he said, as we mirror the Lord, so we become what we mirror. It's a powerful thing. It's as if the mirror produces a DNA in us of what we are to be. And so if we could mirror the Lord perfectly, we will become perfect like the Lord. But inside each one of us, we are like choppy waters. And uh, for example, uh, sometimes when you, let's say there's a lake right here, and then there's a scenic mountain, snow-capped mountains, and a forest all around. And if you are one of those uh, photographers who like to take sceneries, you'll be looking to take a scenery, a photo 
of the mountain with all the nice surroundings reflected on the water. And some of you have seen those photographs. And you see the mountain right in the lake. And the lake exactly having a mirror image of the mountain. Lovely scenery. That's only possible because the waters of the lake are calm. But if the waters are not calm and it's choppy, you see the image all twisted in the mountain zigzag. And so in each one of us, there are thoughts, there are emotions, there are desires, there are all kinds of uh, imaginations, all those things flowing through us. And unless all those things that ruffle and, uh, and cause the storm within us, unless the storm within us is calm, we cannot reflect the glory of the Lord. We can't see anything. That is why peace leads the way to see the Lord. When you're still in your heart, that is one of the meditation process and contemplation. And a lot of people are afraid of silence. Because when you go in the silence, you hear your own internal thoughts too loud. And if they're horrible thoughts, you can't face yourself. They, you, you hear your own emotions. You hear your own imaginations. And they're making so much noise that you can't live with yourself. So they go and drown their sorrows in okay, alcohol or all those things. But if you are peaceful on the inside, you love peace and quiet. Because in the peace and quiet, all you hear is the voice of God speaking to creation and the voice of God flowing to all and everything around you. You could hear, like the song says, uh, you know, in that song uh, that talks about the beauty of the earth. Um, uh, and then it talks about, uh, in one of the old hymns, and I talk about the beauty of the earth. And uh, then it talk about uh, hearing the, the, the heavenly spears resounding on the earth. What a beautiful old hymn. And it's important for us to realize that peace can produce that. That's how peace can let, lead to horao, seeing the visual part. And as we see as the peace of God and God sees and God's reflected within us, then in that harmony, we enter into a powerful dimension of the Spirit. The greatest conquest in your life is to conquer thyself. Doesn't the book of Proverbs say it's far greater for a man to conquer himself in his own spirit than to conquer a city. To have control of himself. Than to control, than to have a control of an entire city. And if we want to have victory in our Christian life, it's important to discover that. Peace in our heart. Now, peace can conquer our heart and our mind. For some people, the peace is only in the heart but not in the mind. But in Philippians 4 verse 7, the peace will garrison the heart and the mind to Christ Jesus. When that takes place, when that takes place, the conquest has taken place. Second Corinthians 10 is fulfilled. Every thought is taken subject to Jesus Christ. And it, it talks about warfare in 2 Corinthians 10. That every thought must be brought subject to Christ. The question is, how is that subject brought to Christ? Through the peace of God. And of course, we did illustrate in our notes there that you can turn to once again, that uh, in Pharrell, uh, we look up there, I have a little cross-reference. Yes, we look at Isaiah 26 verse 3, which has been made into a song, which says literally, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. 
Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. So, whose mind is stayed on him. Uh, the perfect peace in the Hebrew, which you could do a, a Hebrew exegetical teaching, in Isaiah 26 3, in Hebrew is actually uh, Nasa, Shalom, Shalom. So perfect peace is shalom, shalom. Shalom squared <laughs> equals perfect peace. Powerful. So it's not just one shalom is already good enough. So he goes to shalom squared. <laughs> it's almost like Einstein. He said E equals to MC squared. The speed of light not good enough. Speed of light squared. <laughs> So here is Shalom Squared becomes perfect peace. And the word here, Nassau, means to protect, to watch over. But I like uh, Azar 26 verse 3 because it says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Whose mind. And the word mind in the Hebrew in Isaiah 26 3 is the Hebrew word, yetza, which is an unusual word for mind. It's not the normal word for mind. It's the word that means vision, imagination, seeing. The yetza in the Old Testament is equivalent to dianoia in the Greek, the visual part of our mind. And even I'm cross-referencing here, even Isaiah 26, 3 tells us, the only place that we can have Nasa Shalom, Shalom, perfect peace, is when Yetzer is focused on God. So it lines up with what we see here in Philippians 4, 7, that talks about the peace that guards, and in the word God, watching over, from the word visualizing, hurrah. It's all tied together in this area of the peace. And if, if this verse is so powerful, if you have the peace of God in your heart, natural forces are scared of you. Because you remember the storms that come when Jesus was in a boat, in the in the in the Bible stories in the gospel, Jesus was asleep, and he was taking a nap as they were crossing, and then the storm comes, and the disciples were worried, and so they wake him up and say, "Master, Master, don't you care that we perish?" Jesus got up, probably went to the edge of the boat. And he says, peace be still. And everything quiets. Now, unless he have the peace inside him, he cannot release the peace out. Because some of us might try it, but inside you is a little thunderstorm <laughs> with black clouds, flashes of lightning, zoom, 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 zoom. Oh, the turmoil going on. But outside, you look very calm. But inside, what? Oh, thunderstorm. All wet inside. And then you try to say, peace be still. Thunderstorm came up. <laughs> worse still. You make it worse. Hey, what do you do? We are now, just now we were drowning. Now we are really in the waters. <laughs> you can't give what you don't have. Peace is so powerful that you could go to sickness and disease. And sickness and disease can be conquered by peace. What is sickness and disease? Disharmony and the body not at peace. And you could go to the body, which is all in havoc, and you could release the peace of God on the body, and the body suddenly becomes harmonized. The temperature drops, everything flows, and healing starts coming forth. You could go to a place or you are in a deliverance ministry and the peace of God is so strong in your life. Demons screaming on one side. Higher fallen demons accusing on one side. 
and uh, horrifying demons with <laughs> tattoos all over them, you know, making fierce faces at you, <laughs> and all surrounded by demons. But if you have the peace of God, you will not even flick one hair on your head because you got the peace. And all you have to do is, is with all their rowdiness, and you must understand the devil don't have peace. Demons don't have peace. And you just say, peace be still. Shoom. They will all run away because they are in disharmony. Which is why Romans chapter 16, verse 20 tells us, in Romans 16, verse 20, it says here, And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. Hallelujah. You would have thought the God of thunder and lightning, the God of fierce, mighty power. But here, the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet because the devil is afraid of peace. That is why even in a natural world, the devil and his fallen angels are out creating this harmony among nations. They don't like peace because in peace, they cannot prevail. They try, but they can't. So they try to cause divisions of nations, divisions among friends, divisions among churches, divisions among ministries. The devil likes to cause disharmony. But when you have the peace of God in your life, you could release the peace into your environment. Remember what Jesus said when he sent his disciples two by two? He says to them, and that's when uh, he also sent the other 120, uh, 70 disciples. Luke chapter 10, he tells them that when you go to a house and you say, peace to the house, and your peace will go upon the house. Powerful. So you could transmit that peace. And the secret to harmonious family relationship is the peace of God. What did the Bible say about the man of peace? God will call him sons of God, peacemakers. Sons of God. See, sons of God equal peacemakers. Because we rule and reign and we create peace everywhere we go. And so, peace is a powerful force. I want to show forth that Warfare, interestingly, is done through the force of the power of the peace of God in your heart. And uh, it's interesting because sometimes you get, uh, once in a while, I seldom, seldom, seldom have these uh, spiritual warfare situations. Once in a while, you have them. And uh, last night, hey, interesting one. And uh, so one bike and... Then there was this, uh, one of the principalities... Uh, over uh, this region. And that principality came. And uh, not, not to the house, it was taken to another place. And that principality was looking. Well, it was, uh, it was like a, a wow person. Ooh. Strangely, they can appear in different form, but the one that I saw was like a white colored uh, hair, and like, like it's been here a long time in this region. Fierce looking face. And a horrifying looking thing. And I think that if an ordinary Christian has seen it, your Peng San died, gone home, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, fierce looking fellow. And came right next to me and look, I bought, I bought. <laughs> It's almost like the experience of um, 
what's this guy who wrote the book, Demons and Eyewitness Account? Howard Pittman, that's right. Howard Pittman was taken into the spiritual realm and he saw the fallen angels. Fallen angels were like an army marching. And he says they behave different from normal demons. Normal demons, they see you, they run away, they're scared. These fallen angels were directly under the first rank under Satan. They, they look very tall, handsome, fierce-looking soldiers of, of Satan. And they were marching like an army. And then one of them saw Howard Payman and came near to Howard Payman and he eyeballed him. Say, what eyeball? No, he didn't take out his eyeball. It's like, <laughs> and frighten him. <laughs> like those jokers they do. You know? Now they sell even false eyeball. Ching! <laughs> frighten the people. And, uh, so, he eyeball him. He go, eyeball to eyeball. And his humble opinion said, thankfully, you know, the presence of Jesus was there and he was not afraid. But that's how fierce they were. So, last night was an interesting experience, you know. Who oh, eyeball to eyeball. And I'm quite used to those kind of things. So I said, so I look and he say, peace <laughs> on the earth. For some reason, eh? peace, the peace of God. And then I said, I'm not afraid of you. And so then suddenly this one turned around and didn't just go frightenedly. You know, most demons, they go, hey, and run. Then go, And I knew what that was. That were one of the principalities that were over uh, certain regions. But it's interesting that you can reach a stage where you have no more fear. You have no fear of these things. Jesus was not afraid of the devil. Not one bit. You know what? Jesus went through the 40 days in the wilderness. I'm sure you... Uh, it's not recorded, but it's recorded after the 40 days. There were three last temptations. Remember in one of the temptations, the devil took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple. The devil, I repeat, took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple. I don't know how he took Jesus. Whether the devil just came, carried Jesus, <laughs> and, you know, to the temple, whatever. Yeah, I didn't try because it could be too heavy for me. <laughs> Need to fast another 120 days, and I'll give you a try. <laughs> and so, can you imagine that the transportation system was the devil? Right? Some people see the devil already ping sun die, you know. Jesus was carried by the devil. Was he afraid that the devil would just drop him? No, of course not. The devil dropped him, angel catch him. Catching game. Chew, no, no problem. He was not one bit afraid of the enemy. And he just replied to the devil, you know, and said, It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. It didn't record how he came down, though. Whether the devil went off and then Jesus was hanging in the pinnacle of the temple. <laughs> of course. But I assume that somehow, you know, God, the angels will transport him actually down. Yeah, but that's an interesting temptation. See, we don't ask questions like that. The devil took him up, then he rebuked the devil. The devil went away. Who took Jesus down? <laughs> right? Assume the angels, of course. But this peace is a powerful peace. And emphasize. And it's more important to have the peace inside us than to have it outside. Because when it's inside you, you are, quote unquote, a conqueror. In Christ, of course, not on your own strength. If your internal peace cannot be disrupted, you will win. You will win. But if inside you he can succeed in producing turmoil, you have already lost. That's why this peace of God must garrison our heart and our mind. There must be a way to maintain this, which is in the next verse, in verse 8. He teaches about some areas which to maintain this area. 
And uh, he says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, noble, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, praiseworthy, meditate on this thing because this will maintain that peace. And we have to list all of them out there because uh, you just have a quick look at all these listings and we go down, downwards uh, on the listing of all the pure, lovely, uh, all this listing here. That will be the next page down. That's it, all this. So we just have a quick look at some of the Greek words involved. The word true is from the word alites, which is from the word alitia, which means true. In order to maintain the peace of God, you must meditate on the things which are truth. Truth and true is different. It's the word, not just true, it's the word alites, which is alitia, which means truth. For example, it is true that we experience the sun going around the earth. But the truth is that the earth is going around the sun. So something can be true but not the truth. And it is important that we need to get back to the truth which is the Word of God. If it's inside the Word of God and you base your belief system on the Word of God and you meditate only on the Word, anything not in line with the Word you reject, the peace of God can be maintained. Honest is the word semnos, which is the root word sibomai, meaning to rev revere, to honor. So the word honest doesn't mean what we know as in honesty kind of thing. The word means to give honor where honor is due. Give reverence or respect where respect is due. Now that talks about relationship with people. And when we, when we relate to people, one of the things that I find in the spiritual world is everyone is so polite to one another. They honor and so respectful to one another. And one of the things about the mansions in heaven, do you realize that in our new bodies in heaven, or even if your bodies are not given yet and you, you die and you're in Christ, you've got your spirit and soul, you can actually walk through walls. Jesus did walk through walls. Jesus appeared when the door was shut. And uh, you remember Jesus appeared to them? And you remember what Jesus said to them? What was his words? Ah, now you're getting it. Peace. You know why he says peace? Say peace. They're all very frightened. They're all in fear. They're all in doubt. So he releases his peace. Peace to you. And then, uh, if you remember the story, then uh, he ate fish with them. Or he ate some, something with them. And uh, after he ate, then he disappeared. He went through the wall after they touched him. It's interesting, isn't it? The new body that Jesus had. Now we understand how Jesus can go through the wall with his body. But then he ate fish. Or he ate whatever they were eating that day. He ate something. Fish, I think it was. Then he went through the wall. What happened to the fish? <laughs> he went through, he ate the fish. He go through, all the fish came out and the body left. Because the fish are normal molecules. But the fish went with him. Right through the wall. In heaven, you could, in your new body, you could go through walls. But people still inform one another and they still come to the, let's say you got a mansion in heaven. Wouldn't it be interesting if since people can go through, then they decide to make your living room in your mansion, if there's a living room, uh, as a place where people can walk through. Zoom, 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 zoom. No, they don't do things like that in heaven. They can do that because they can walk through walls. But if they visit you, they'll still come to the front door and say, Hello, Eddie. Hello there. And Eddie will come out from his mansion. Hi there. Welcome into my house. And he just will welcome into his mansion. We could have walked through the wall. If Eddie was in his living room, I could go to the wall and say, Hi, Eddie. Eddie oh, you, you, where did you come from? Well, just came through your wall. <laughs> They don't do that in heaven. They're very polite. And there is such a thing as the, the understanding, respect, 
honour to whom honour is due, reverence to whom reverence is due. One of the things between husbands and wives, they told, is to respect one another. Do you realise that one of the first things to fall apart in relationship is when they stop respecting one another? When you start lo- losing respect for people that you love, you treasure, then everything else falls apart. And there are two interesting verses in the Bible that show that angels respect the system. One of them is in 1 Corinthians 6, which says we were just angels. Do you remember that little verse? Suddenly, Paul thought, say, don't, don't do this to one another. Don't, don't drag each other to court and all this. He said, don't you know that one day we were just angels? Suddenly, out of the blue. Then another one is in 1 Corinthians 11, where he's writing about women, you know, the long hair and what their glory and all this thing. Then suddenly out of the blue, he says, you know, uh, women should keep long hair because of the angels. And some of you say, hey, where are these words in the Bible? God, uh, God, such a words. Yes, you didn't read your Bible enough. <laughs> Look at 1 Corinthians. And uh, it's in your Bible in Corinthians. And uh, some of you may have read that passage and are wondering what it means. So let me point to the one first in 1 Corinthians 6, where it says in verse 3, Do you not know that we shall judge angels? And then the other verse is in 1 Corinthians 11, where he talks women should have long hair. And uh, then he says here in verse 10, For this reason, the women ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Do you see in verse 10? It's in your Bible. Have you wondered what does it mean? What does it mean? Do we really judge angels? See, why women should respect authority, have a symbol of authority on head? Because of the angels. Why? What does it do with the angels? What does the covering on the head have to do with angels? And so scholars have tried to interpret You could either see it in this various possible interpretation. Firstly, you say, oh, all these angels, they are bad angels. They're the fallen angels. And we will judge the fallen angel in 1 Corinthians 6. And these are all the fallen angels. If the women didn't respect the uh, the husband, have a simple authority, uh, and uh, this fallen angel, fallen angel, yeah, yeah, fallen angel, what, what would the fallen angel do? You mean if a if woman didn't, didn't respect him as symbol of authority, the fallen angel would jump on her <laughs> and conquer her like maybe Genesis 6 all over again. Frightening thought, isn't it? How far can theologians pull this? So why? Because of the angels. And then the other question I'd like to ask, what about the man? <laughs> what happens if the man don't respect authority? Why not they say, because of the angels? <laughs> So one theory is try to slap it all to bad angel. But then that raises more question. You mean that, that the fallen angels are hanging around to see whether women got long hair or not? So women, you know, one day she has cancer treatment, both up, finish. <laughs> right? Sometimes you got uh, your chemotherapy or whatever, and then they shave your head and uh, you got a brain operation or something, shave the hair, then suddenly she got no long hair. So the, oh, the demon jump on her. Fallen angel jump on her. <laughs> You don't die. So that's your theory. All the bald-headed person die. No, horrible doctrine. Well, if it's not fallen angel, if it's good angel, also got question. Then if it's a good angel, you say, do we really judge them? 1 Corinthians 6. Then the other question in 1 Corinthians 11, also same question. What does the good angel have to do with this woman having a simple authority on her head? What has that to do? So you got two possible ways to interpret and no more. There's no such thing as half good, half bad angel. Don't know where you got that from. Only from the cartoons. <laughs> Angels are either good or they're either bad. There's no half half. So your interpretation has to choose either way. I would rather choose that these are good angels. Because I know angels hang around us all the time, guardian angels. And so this is a possible interpretation that I offer up. 
assuming that these are good angels that Paul referred to, there is human being and there is angels. In 1 Corinthians 6, it is possible that as we grow in Christ, and I repeat, not on your own, only in Christ. Because Christ is higher than the angels, correct? And the prophecy was about Him in Psalms 8. When He says, you have made man a little lower than the angels. And now you exalted Him. The prophecy is repeated in Hebrews and talks about Jesus being exalted. Of course, I know all the Hebrew words that in Psalms 8, it says the word is Elohim. But then you look at the Septuagint, which says angel, and when that verse is quoted in the book of Hebrews, they again put angel. So it is in direct reference also to angels. That was Paul's understanding in the book of Hebrews was written. And so we have that in Christ, it is possible, these are angels who serve God, these are human beings who are redeeming Christ. It is possible for us to rise in authority until even on the planet Earth and perhaps onwards in Christ that some of us might have the potential to have spiritual positions higher even than the angels. But I put it this way because I don't think it's all the angels. I doubt any one of us will be judging Michael the Archangel. <laughs> I doubt that. Right. So, you know, that means, boy, your progress so high. I doubt that. So definitely, he said angels, he didn't say all the angels. And uh, so, 1 Corinthians 6 is an interesting truth, which gives us the potential to realize. And I've been to the spiritual world and I realized one thing. It is possible to walk with God so close that you have angels placed under your command in Christ. You say, wow, God, angels are under my command. Wow. No, no, no. Some people again take every doctrine to the extreme. Then they start commanding angels like they're servants. Hey, 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 do this. Hey, 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 do that. What? Hey, you think the angel means hey? Uh? <laughs> they all got names. And then some people send your angels, do this, do this. Of what? Like angels like your mate like that. Worse than your mate, no pay from you. <laughs> And you're send, sending them all over the place. No, this is abuse of angelic system. <laughs> By the time you have authority over angels, you work with them as a team. You will never abuse a system. So if you thought that, wow, I got so many angels serving me. They send angel here, send angel there, go here, go there, do there. Wow, oh, angels all over the place. Wrong view of angels. When you work with them, say, it is possible to work in such a manner that your progress in Christ, I repeat, not by yourself, in Christ, that because as Christ becomes more and more a part of you, and more and more you do the work of Christ, that the spiritual anointing and authority is given to you, that you could command, and the angels will beat, because your command is so much in God. You remember Eli Elisha? And uh, he was surrounded by the Syrian army. He had a little boy servant with him. And then, Elisha says, Do not fear. They who are with us are more than they that are against us. The little boy looked at him. They. You mean they. We they. <laughs> One, two. <laughs> There, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. And then Elisha says, Lord, open his eyes. And then the boys thought, wow! They were definitely more spiritual chariots and, and all the angelic beings around more than the Syrian army. And they were all waiting for one word from Elisha. Just one word. And the moment Elisha gave a word, all the Syrians were blinded. Doesn't that show the authority a man can have in a spiritual world? What about Joshua? When he did God's will and he went to battle. And he said, Son, stop where you are. 
Moon, stop where you are. And he says, nowhere in the history of mankind has God ever hearkened to the voice of a human being to stop the sun and the moon. And of course, if you know science, you realize that for the sun to stop, the moon to stop, the earth also has to stop. Because the earth is still moving, you can see it moving. Now, of course, you and I know it's not Joshua. It's not Joshua. We humans are so tiny compared to the whole planet Earth. What about the sun, which is even bigger? You know, no one can actually stop the moon and the, and, and the sun in a physical way. All the atoms, the atom bombs that we send out will not help. It won't stop anything. It will blow the, it might blow a small part of the moon apart. But it won't stop it. You need a greater force. But when Joshua commanded, the angels who are in charge of those areas, in charge of the creation of God, under God command, they could stop the entire movement of the sun. They could stop the entire movement of the moon. They could stop the entire movement of the earth. Never before have a human being exercised such authority. So, 1 Corinthians 6, humans who walk with God have the ability to develop an authority such that God gave them the grace to place angels under their charge. Interesting. Not all, but I share that so that it will motivate some of you to show what we can be like while on earth. See, some of us, and last night on the way back, Pastor James was talking to me and said, hey, in 1 Corinthians, was it uh, Philippians 3, you were asking about the upward call. That the upward call that Paul de- desired, was it just ministry call? It was not. It was something he desired that is in the spiritual realm. The upward call. It's not talking about all the five four ministries. These are ordinary things. Upward call. He wanted something beyond this planet. That closeness with God. Oh, we need more Christians like that. You know, here the Bible got so many promises. Imagine all these things. And then Christians just happy with, you know, oh God, give me my daily bread. Help me pay my rental. And uh, give me enough money in the bank. Or help me with all these things. And then they die because all these things pass away. They cannot take to heaven. They got nothing left. See, Christianity is more than all these things. We miss all these wonderful things. If you develop your spiritual authority while here, when you die, you retain your spiritual authority. What a missed blessing. No, what a missed blessing that people have. What they're chasing after the things of this earth, which God could easily just give them. God, you just, and then it's all theirs. And they spend so much spiritual energy wanting those things. They forgot these spiritual things that are so more glorious that God wants to give. Not forgetting 1 Corinthians 11. When angels work with us, they look at our spiritual order. Remember what the Bible says that rebellion is as the as a sin of witchcraft. So when we rebel against authorities that are set up by God, when we rebel against people, was David rebellious against King Saul? No. King Saul was not a really good king, but David flowed with the channel of authority, didn't he? He understood. He says he will not be the one who ends Saul's life. He rather God does it. Because as long as Saul is there, he respects the anointing that was there. God gave it to him, let God take it away. Not, let not David or another man take it. But all his other mighty men says, here's the chance, let's kill him. Because if he die, who else do you think will be king? David. David. David says, not by my own hand. And there are authorities in the home. We need to respect authorities in the home. How things flow. Authorities within a, a, a body of Christ. Authorities, all this respect to one another. Respect without being oppressed. Without being dictators. Talking about count one another in love. But yet there's an authority that flow. 
Didn't the Bible say in 1 Peter chapter 3, let the husbands love their wives and dwell with them with understanding so that their prayers are not hindered? You remember that word? Now, if the prayers are hindered, don't you think that the angels have stopped working? So it's talking about harmony in the home. If the home is in disharmony, the angels cannot work. The good angels cannot work. That explains 1 Corinthians 11, where it's especially talking about harmony in the home. The Greek word for woman is the word gyne, which talks about a relationship in the home that's harmonious. Again, even more important to have peace in the home, peace in your work, peace in any place, which is why we are, we are carriers of peace. We go and we release peace so that the angels could do their work. And that's where we explain how the angelic work can do a mighty work in each one of us. All from that little word number two. We better speed up. <clears throat> go to fifth gear. <laughs> All right. We better speed up a bit. So here we have the word honest. It's not just a normal word honest. It's a word meant to revere, to honor. To give honor to where honor is due. We are not giving glory to one another. All glory belongs to the Lord. But if you read the Bible, God doesn't share His glory, but God shares His honor. He told Joshua, from this day forward, I will make your name great. That is honor. God is honoring. So let's honor one another. Respect one another. That will help the flow of peace. Just is, of course, more than the word just. It's the word dikaios, which is normally translated righteousness. So meditate on the things that are righteousness. Not condemnation, righteousness. Pure is actually the word hagnos, which is the root word hagios, which is holy. The word pure is not just pure. It means meditate on the holy things of God. Now you can see it's deeper than what the translation gives us. And the word lovely, it's not just the word lovely. It's actually the, the friendship love for pros filio, which is a filio increase in the intimate sense. Meditate on the things that, that, are, that have been an encouragement, a fellowship. There are times when we agape love. But in the Bible, you also have filial love, where you're meditating on the good things of filial love. The good things in the body of Christ. And uh, things like, and you know, filial love in, includes your, your marriage relationship, your, your father and, your, and, a, and, a, and a mother and a parents and, and sons and daughters. All these include agape love and filial love with one another. And uh, so, friendship, as you, as you maintain good friendship. And of course, agape love is great. It even love your enemies. It tells you, these are part of maintaining the peace of God in your life. Good report is from the word euphemos, root word eu and fema. And a good report. Fema means a good saying, a famous saying. You is good. So you can see that it's talking about meditating on those things that are like proverbs. Those things that are well-known principles that you know works, that you know is truth. And uh, we know that there are things that we could, humans have summarized. Like... Uh, uh, like for Jesus, he says, you know, all things are possible to him that believe it. So that's a good saying. And there are other good little sayings that talk what you can, what, uh, and that's not from message from the Bible, but you find the principles in the Bible. What uh, uh, you can uh, uh, conceive, you can achieve. And uh, things like uh, all these little sayings. Every one of us have principles and little sayings in our life. We have developed them. Every one of us live by principles. And so meditate on those principles. Like, for example, even principles of love. That we know that love is so important. So when, when whatever happens to us, we always tell ourselves, it's important 
to give up love. That my only response is love. That is one of my principles. Whatever happens, I will catch myself saying, my only response must be love. Because I don't want to respond in any other way. And always uh, develop those, those saying, things that work in your life, that you practice in principle. And uh, virtue is from the word arite, uh, for aren and asen, meaning manliness of val valor. So virtue is a sort of, uh, for lack of a better word, manliness. In other words, uh, to be uh, what you are supposed to be. Manliness of a woman, you know, what you are to, your role as a woman, your role as a man, your role as a father, your role as a son, your role as a daughter, your role as a sister, your role as a brother. So, you know, the roles that each one of us are to, are to fulfill. Whoa, so many things to meditate. And uh, praiseworthy from the word epinos, which... Uh, Epi and Ainio. Ainio, uh, Epi is upon, Ainio is to pray, to celebrate. Meditate on those things that are celebrating, things that makes you happy, things that makes you joyful. In other words, so many things to meditate, so we summarize it with one, one, one thing and one thing alone, and that is that the things that give you love, joy, peace. Let only every thought that has love, joy, peace, let every emotion, do not allow emotions that doesn't have love, joy, peace to remain in you. You might be tempted and twisted sometimes around your emotions, get twisted and turned by people, but you get back to your default, love, joy, peace. Go back to love, joy, peace. And every thought in my head, I always check with God. I make sure that the thoughts are Love, joy, peace. I will refuse to entertain thoughts that doesn't have love, joy, peace. And sometimes when you converse with people, you know, when, you, when you're alone, it's okay to have all your thoughts to yourself. When you fellowship, and, and then you start fellowship with people at a different spiritual level, some people, you know, they, because their life is filled with anxious thoughts, fearful thoughts, uh, hurtful thoughts, and uh, maybe angry thoughts. And then in the conversation, they go, Anger coming out, they got this coming out, all these things, and, and all those things, those thoughts are coming to you because you're listening to the conversation, and something in you have to push it back, say, okay, this one, let me, let me bring it all to the cross. And then when you look at this person, you realize, you know, this person doesn't realize these are the very things that cause the problems in their own life. Because they're not getting rid of all these things. They're allowing it to simmer within them killing themselves both physically in their soul and worse still in the spirit. It's important to clean ourselves up. Only have love, joy, and peace. So that's a little summary of that Philippines thing. And uh, so fifth gear, not fast enough. Sixth gear. See, got six gear. Yeah, the new Mercedes car, the most expensive one. Eight gears. Right. So anyway, uh, Philippians chapter 4. And... Uh, we see here, and Paul says in verse 9, or oh, this verse 9 is a very interesting verse. Because he says, the things which you learn and receive and heard and saw in me, four things, learn, receive, heard, saw in me, these do. The word learn is a really poor translation. Philippians 4, 9. Let's look at this translation here. And... Um, the word learn in Philippians 4 verse 9, which is repeated again in Philippians 4 verse 11, where Paul says, I have learned in whatever state that I am to be content. That word learn is not translated properly. It's from the Greek word in Philippians 4 verse 9, the word learn in Philippians 4 verse 11. Uh, we go down to the word learn, we jump ahead, we leave all those little, little words out here. It's also in Philippians 4.11. The word learn is the word mentano. Mentano. Now, most of us do not know the word mentano, but remember that the word disciples in the Greek. In the Greek, the word prophets is prophetess. The word disciples is martyrs. 
Disciples are the word martyrs. Martyrs is the noun. Disciples. To disciple, the word is mantano. Yes, the word learn is the word mantano. So what Paul was saying here in verse 9, the things which you have been discipled in, ah, and discipling involves receiving the things you hear, you saw. Paul himself had been discipled. So when he says these things that you have learned through discipleship, he says do them. So it's not just like we read a book, then we do. Or we hear a sermon, then we do. Or we learn three principles and we do. That's not discipleship. Discipleship is Jesus and his disciples walking together for three years. That's discipleship. Where you live with a person. Discipleship, a close modern word that we have is like mentoring. Apprentice system. You know, in an apprentice system, where you have the expert, a mechanic or whatever they are, electrician, and then you have an apprentice learning under you. Of course, both must know the theory. But then you do the application together. And just like, for example, you could read all you want about what the different parts of the human body is, is like. You could even study everything in detail. But if you haven't cut open a human body, you can't be a surgeon. According to my daughter, who is a GP, and when you do GP, uh, you, you do a bit of surgery, and then after that you go GP, then you can specialize. So in the, among the doctor's training, they give them a little bit of everything. Among them is surgery. So they do a little bit, and they have to dissect. No, they don't dissect frogs like all of us in sec one, sec two. Dissect human body. So that's why if you can't stand blood, you can't be a doctor. Why you look open? Oh. <laughs> so a lot of people fall off. You got to stand all these things. And they get to dissect a dead human body. And don't ask me where they got the human bodies from. They have a system in which you know, the bodies are, are there for the, for the students to dissect. Yes, this is real life medical training, dissect a human body. When you hear about it, you say, ear. Yes, it is ear. And my doctor was telling me one time in the training, he said, oh, you read all the books, all the parts where they are, but every human being is different. <laughs> and then she said, one day, this body to dissect was a big fellow. You see, when they cut, they say, wow, the fat was so much, cannot find the parts. <laughs> so can you imagine, in the operating theatre, they not only had to take the skin, you know, and they clean everything so surgical, they tie it nicely, take the skin. Well, nowadays, everyone is all obese. They have to cut the layer of fat also, and tie it up nicely, before they can get to the organs and do the operation. So, Learning in theory and seeing where it is a different place, plus all of us, our, our internal organs are slightly in different places. Yes. Not everybody, all your liver is exactly where the draw, diagram is in your encyclopedia. Could be all in slightly different places. And then some of us put on fat, flat, all over the place, so it push your organs out of place. <laughs> Who knows your kidney should be here? <laughs> Instead of here. <laughs> I'm just joking. But it's important for us to realize that the practice is different from the theory. So if you're about to, you know, God, pr we pray, of course, that no one needs to go to operation, all in divine help. But if you come to the stage that, let's say, a person needs an operation, would you want someone who operate you, who you say, hey, have you operated anyone before? No, heaven. Oh, All right, you write a book. <laughs> you wouldn't. Discipleship is alongside, which means 
that Paul was saying, hey, look, folks, you have prayed with me. Which is why in, in, in our church, that's why we have all night prayer. That's why I mean all night praying, praying also. You pray, I pray. You see me pray, you pray. It's a life thing together. And we do the prayer together. And, and it's important. We serve the Lord together. And uh, if we travel to minister, we do ministry, we learn to do ministry together. It's important for us to know that there's a practical way of doing things too. They're not that's just a theory. And uh, come to the actual practice, people develop funny methods, even casting out demons, for example. And uh, uh, people read, oh, the name of Jesus. Oh, yes, yes, they know in theory. Then when an actual demon is just screaming their head off, you find all their funny, funny uh, methods come in. You know, and some of their methods would be, you know, okay, what's your name? 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 Huh? Oh, Beelzebub. Beelzebub, come out. Any other name? Apollo, Apollo, come out. <laughs> we start, we start coming out with all funny methods just because we, we react to the scenery and we couldn't keep to the original way that it's supposed to be until if we could only watch Jesus and see how Jesus did it. I can guarantee you, Jesus didn't ask all the demons by name. Remember the man with the legion? Which? Approximately 6,000. Jesus didn't have to say, okay, you know, legion, oh, we are many, we are legion, my name is legion. That's the head. Jesus didn't have to say, okay, give me all the other 5,999 names. <laughs> and Jesus stick to the list. Who has like, you know, il Sabab. Okay, il Sabab go. Next! Il Salu. Okay, Il Salu. Okay. And can we go in order? I, J, K. All right. <laughs> A long time casting out the demon. Jesus in one moment and that was it. And the problem with us is sometimes we learn theory, but we see practical people do differently. You remember the story I told, you know, how to minister baptism in the Spirit. Some people, they, they pray for people. You know, in theory, they say Jesus baptized in the Spirit. They say, by faith you receive. But in practice, they pray for people they say, uh, say after me. Uh, say after me. Okay, say, you know, uh, say, uh, ar -ar 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 -ar. <laughs> say, then the person say, ar -ar -ar -ar. oh, you got it. <laughs> what kind of methodology is that? You know, baptize in the speech. Say, you know, everybody just copy, copy your tongue and then you say, that's God baptizing. That's not, that's not, that's copying your tongue. But some other people even say, okay, now say praise the Lord. Say praise the Lord. You receive, believe you receive. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Now say the Lord, praise the Lord fast, fast. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, you got it, you are baptized in the Spirit. <laughs> all kinds of methods that we come up with. And it's all just, you know, invented by us. That's not the way to receive the baptism in the Spirit. There are better ways than that. But in a vacuum of the right ways, people develop all the wrong ways. Which is important for us to get back to the original, to develop the methods that Jesus wants for us. And our methodology and our theology must be in line with the Word of God. Well, Paul did say in verse 11 that he was disciple. He himself, he says, not, not that I speak in regard for, I have been disciple. I have learned whatever state I am, he says. That's an interesting statement when he says, uh, whatever state I am, uh, to, to be content. Uh, and we look at uh, verse 12 where he says he has learned in all things to be a base. The word a base in verse 12, he says, is the word that means to be humble. Paul says he has learned to be humble. Taipaino from the Greek word taipaino. That's gone now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Eh? Taipaino. Okay. <laughs> it's gone. And uh, that's the word taipaino uh, uh, in verse 12, which is the normal word for being humble, being humiliated. Now, that's not something that's easy for us to, to understand but Paul here, he basically is saying, he, he learned how to, be, to live humbly. He know how to abound 
and he know how to abase. He learned both to be full and he learned to be hungry, to abound, to suffer need. He's all right. Whoa, praise the Lord. Okay, those of you, today we are testing your eyesight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, if you can't see this clearly, you come forward and we'll pray for your eyesight. <laughs> Oh, we're back to normal. All right. And uh, right, let's go to verse, um, verse 12. And uh, verse 12. And uh, Taipaino. Uh, let's go lower. It's lower. Instructed, that's where we have gone. We had touched on that yesterday. Taipaino. And yes. He learned to be full. Let's go downwards. Uh, and to be hungry. Do you have Taipaino? Let's get my one out. Uh, it's the first 412 that is there, right after content. So it's upwards in my notes. Ah, this one, this looks like coming upwards. That's the one. Ah, Taipaino, this is the one. Taipaino is from the normal word to be humble, to live humbly. And that's interesting because we always talk about humility. And people don't realize that big humility can be also learning how to cut your coat according to your cloth. See, faith message, we know that God prosper us. We know that God provides for us. But then we, we also must be sensible when, when God prospers us. What is the only reason why we should spend our money luxuriously when there are people still in need around us. What's the logic of that? There's no logic. It's only the desires of the flesh to want to have the best. Now, I don't have a problem with people driving what they can afford. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with people that, uh, uh, what do we call, uh, spending what they have earned with their hard-earned money, and they are already generous without a fault to help many people. Then by all means, God bless them, you know, you want to be one of those astronauts, pay 200000 and go up for five minutes and come down. You don't have a problem. Well, you're going to spend about $10 million and join one of those space lab people and go experience, experience, wow, $10 million and come back. Say, oh, I've been to outer space, you know. We don't have a problem with that. If you have your own hard-earned money, you've done your part for helping the world, helping others, then you've got your part, by all means, you know, you enjoy. There is a problem. If your money comes to charity and you live luxuriously, something doesn't work, correct? So, uh, it's different, of course, if you are working in a charity and you got your own source of income and you don't touch the income of the charity. Let's say you have uh, your own investments and your own things that you invest in and you got harvest from there, you have been generous and you spend based on that. That's different. But if you spend money that was designated for the ministry, in a luxurious Jaguar car. Don't you think there's something wrong? It's important for us to do it. Remember, we're not against people who live and you cut your coat according to your cloth. I mean, it's your hard-earned money, you have been generous, you've done your part for the poor, you help all the others, no problem. I need to be balanced here, remember. I need to be balanced. And uh, so, we don't have a problem with that. The problem is, if the funds come from charity or ministry, by default, it means everyone in the ministry would have to cut their coat according to the cloth in proportion to everything else. It is the most sensible thing. And uh, we, we need to, to understand that humility, which Paul talks about, he he has no problem being hungry. He has no problem being without. He has no problem eating 
You know, just for illustration in the Asian context, uh, porridge with soy sauce, gam chai. As opposed to one sin, you know, he, and he says, he said, Paul, this is a remarkable thing. Paul also had no problem eating the most expensive dish. That's according to him. Uh, when, what's this black cell, eggs? What's it called? Century. Oh, no, 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 no. Century. <laughs> Century is us Asian. Fish egg, the black color one. Caviar. Ah, hey, expensive. Most expensive caviar. No problem. All right. He, he says he has learned to be full. He has learned to be hungry. But the main thing is humility. Learning humility. And so it's important for us to see here that this is the same Paul who said 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, Jesus died on the cross that we might be rich. This is the same Paul. Now, I would have no problem if Paul sold a million tents and he ate caviar all the time. But if Paul sold one ten. T and T, <laughs> one ten, and ninety nine percent of his income was the offering of people. Then it would be wrong for Paul to eat the caviar, because people send that to do more work, not for him. One person eat all the caviar and nothing left over for the poor. So it depends on where the source of the income is. It's important, but even when our source is correct, it's important to leave balance. If you, the whole world, so Singapore is a pretty well-off society. But let's say you live in India. And 99% of the people around you are scrapping for a living. And right in the midst of the slum, you build your mansion with gold taps. <laughs> Wouldn't you think that's a little bit of abusive of the system? It just doesn't reflect Christ. What? would Jesus do? And you know, just to show that we are balanced, I don't think Jesus has a problem riding in a Mercedes Benz or a BMW. I don't think he has a problem. But at the same time, I also don't think Jesus has a problem riding a bicycle. <laughs> of course, someone else pedal for him. It would be nice. I can't see Jesus, you know. <laughs> Let's put Jesus in a trishaw. That sounds, sounds better. Right? You know, or, or trishaw. Maybe a, a human a running trishaw. No. Right. Jesus has no problem doing that. Humility, Paul says, is the ability to live in all situations. And the Greek word that we saw yesterday, muo, without complaining. Without complaining. That is the ability of Paul. But that's not the end. Here he comes to the best part where he says, and he used the word here uh, in verse 18. Let's jump forward to verse 18 before we look at verse 15 and 17 because it's that, that same part. In uh, Philippians 4, 18, let me grab my other notes on 18, <clears throat> where Paul says, he learned to abound, in 4.18, abound. The word abound is perisio, which means to superabound. To cause to superabound, excel. Uh, so in, in quantity or quality, he abound. He has learned to abound and uh, I am full. Now, the word full here is the word pleru. 418 is the word pleru, the next word down here. Pleru, which is the word full. The word full here means to be completely filled up, furnished, complete, and expire. So full until you just cannot add one more drop. 
That's what the word fool is. He has, lear- he has learned in verse 18, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus a thing sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And then he turned around in verse 19 and says, And my God shall supply all your need. Now, what you cannot see in the Greek is this. In verse 19, he uses the same word fool in the word supply. So he says here, when in verse 18, he says, I am fool and pleru. Then he turns around in verse 19 and he says, and my God shall pleru all your need. So the word just doesn't mean supply. Because the word supply would mean, you know, that you ask for a dollar, he give you a dollar. You ask for $10, he give you $10. It's just supply. But here, it's like, he not only supply, he pours out into you. He pours it into you until there's no more room. So in other words, it's not just the word supply, and my God shall feel all your need. That's the sense. More than just supply. God will fill us so full according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And that's an important phrase because according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus means according to His spiritual wisdom. When when you see the word riches in glory in Christ Jesus, how will God fill our need? What are the riches of the glory in Christ Jesus? Colossians has the answer. In Colossians, it says that we may know what are the riches of the glory of Christ Jesus, Christ in us. The wisdom of Christ. The riches of the storehouse of His knowledge and wisdom. And you think about it, prosperity is all about wisdom. Microsoft became uh, a billionaire company through wisdom and knowledge. An invention that somebody invents, they market it through their wisdom of the invention, through the wisdom of the marketing, they make that product a billionaire dollar product. McDonald's, such a simple concept of a burger. When the original founders took it from one tiny little store, they had the wisdom to market it. And now it's a multi-conglomerate company that is in places you never dream that you go to. What is money? What is prosperity? Ideas and wisdom. Ideas and wisdom. What is a financial problem? Why is it a problem? Because of a lack of money? Or a lack of ideas how to get through the place where there is a lack of money? Every financial problem is an idea problem. Because you might say, I don't have money to pay my way to school. Somebody else also got the same problem. But the somebody else had another idea how to get to school in the same situation as you are. Because they had a better idea. You got stuck with the idea, you got stuck with your position and you got no idea how to get out. No idea how to move forward. There is always a way forward no matter how little money you have. The money is never the issue or the problem. It is wisdom. Because somebody else in your position, perhaps even with less talent, less money than you, might be able to get out of that situation. It is an idea problem. That is why God supply our needs not by opening a bank account or heaven and say, here's the money. God didn't supply our needs by printing money. God supply our needs according 
to the riches of His glory in Christ Jesus, which is a storehouse of His ideas and wisdom. Knowledge, which comes from wisdom, is the key. And this truth is back up in the Old Testament, in the book of Proverbs chapter 8, and several other Proverbs, where wisdom says that silver and gold, wealth is in one hand, long life is in the other. It's all in the spirit of wisdom. When Jesus was asked to pay taxes, Jesus was in control and he says to Peter, go and fish. And out of the first fish that you fish, there will be gold. Pay for your tax, my, my tax and your tax. There was more than abundant. For fishermen, fishing is their livelihood. They fished the whole night and there was no fish. The moment Jesus was there, Jesus knew where the fish was. And Jesus says, Cast your net on the other side. And they said, Lord, the whole night we have been casting our nets out. They said, cast your net out. They cast, and there was so much fish, they couldn't, they could hardly pull it out. It was Jesus, the knowledge of Jesus. When you're in the right place at the right time, the world does not belong to the smartest person. The world belongs to the person who knows God and God puts you in the right place. It is not the smartest person that wins. Neither is it the most talented person. Neither is it the person with the most clever invention. In the end, it is a world of opportunity. With everyone who succeeds, someone else is smarter than them. With everyone who succeeds, Someone else is more talented than them. So you ask yourself, why did they succeed when another could have succeed? Another had an invention. Because they somehow had the wisdom and the favor. Something that works in their life. And we can tell you that the main thing is the wisdom of God. And God did promise that if we were tap upon His wisdom, through his wisdom, he supplies our needs. You have to be in the right place at the right time doing the right thing. I remember, it can be on big matters or simple matters. I remember when we were visiting John Osteen's church. John Osteen is uh, Joel Osteen's dad. So we stayed in the uh, missionary quarters. And uh, then we, uh, and that was the last stop, so we practically used up all our funds. And so when we had no much funds there, and good thing they got some groceries that were there. And then I, I remember as I was, I used to take a walk there too, and I used to walk up and down the place, quite a scenic place in Lakewood. And every step I say, God, I thank you, you supply all my needs according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I thank you, you supply all my needs. Because we do have needs. And then I realized one thing that I should do. You should be doing something. You cannot just sit down and just say, God will supply all my needs. Come on, come on. God will supply all my needs. Come on, come on. <laughs> you might die of starvation and then they'll find a skeleton with a hand like that. <laughs> and then someone say, hey, why this skeleton so strange with a hand like that? <laughs> oh, they were believing God to supply the need and their hands were open for the needs to drop down there. The supply to drop down, but never came. The person starved, died. All the skins all dry up. Now all the organs also die up. The worms eat. Like the skeleton like that. <laughs> so, we learn. And I said, well, we must do something in order to get a supply. So then we found one of the gardeners who were there, who used to, to mow the lawns in Lakewood. Then we found out that that young man is a young man. He goes out street witnessing. Then we'll say, hey, since you witness, we we'll go along with you. See, you've got to do something. If you live by the gospel, you've got to be doing the gospel. Right? If I were an electrician and I do my deals uh, uh, and earn my living as an electrician, I must be doing electrical work. <laughs> you do no work, no pay. So you've got to be doing something to get the pay from somewhere. So you expect God to be your paymaster, but you didn't work for God. 
God said, what do you do? Oh, I was just sitting down with my hands and said, God supplied my needs. Come on, come on. <laughs> That's not work. And so I, I know, of course, to live by the gospel, you've got to do things by the... You've got to be doing something for God. Not that you're doing those things for money, but you're prepared to do it even free. At least God won't let you starve to death while you're preaching. Right? It's common sense. You, you think you're, you're preaching the gospel and then you know, you're so hungry and you're so preaching, oh, wait, you know, not enough stamina to say, repent, you go, re, and then you die. <laughs> God won't let that happen. You're preaching the gospel. So, if you have to have your last breath, that last breath serving God. So we went to the streets. And so on the street, of course we preached the gospel, so my wife was there and I was there. We took the guitar, we borrowed somebody's guitar, and then we sang, you know, amazing grace, and then share the gospel with people. And guess what? There was a crowd there. And then, as we were singing, somebody started coming and I was singing, so both hands are play, when you play the guitar, both hands are occupied. The person came up, dropped $50 note into the pocket. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So we got $50, just singing Amazing Grace. Well, not bad. You know. So, any more songs? Hallelujah. And uh, then, as we continued singing, then when we came back, the news got about that we were street witnessing. And so, for some reason, God must have touched somebody somewhere, and then we got an offering of $200. See, we were doing something when we had no money. You don't wait till the money comes and you do. You do even when you have nothing. And then when you do, now, don't anyone, you take it wrongly, and then you go out to the street, you know, put a big bowl there. <laughs> Amazing. Expect, and then you put there, oh, only $50 note. <laughs> No, no, don't do that. But what the, the main moral of the story is that you have to be doing something. You know? You don't want me to be like the skeleton who sit there, come on, come on, die in that position. So it's important for us to know when God supplies our needs, we have to be doing something. Now, this applies to the ministry. What about in the business world, about out there? Just do the best according to your talents. And if you have done your best, not that you sit down and say, God supply my needs according to His riches and glory. Come on, come on. <laughs> you do your best according to what you have, even when you don't have anything. And you say, if I've got nothing to do, go out and help somebody. If you keep giving your life to people, it keeps sowing good things to people and helping others, don't you realize that somewhere along the line, somebody will help you and you will receive help. If you sow help, you receive help. So if, if you don't have money, find your last breath to help people. And, and if, if, you, if you don't have money, at least you've got your time and your strength. Do something or do whatever. And ask God, of course, don't go in down doing everything, you know. It, God will tell you, God will speak to you. Wisdom and knowledge. It's important for us to understand those areas. And sometimes God will give interesting wisdoms where you have to put yourself in a certain place, in a certain position. And I have seen during the 40-day fasting, a lot of angels working about to bring a lot of blessings. And these blessings are going to come because people have put themselves in the right position in the right place. And they are faithfully doing it and their eyes are not on the money but on Jesus. Tremendous blessings. You will taste of the supply of Jesus, not just supply, feel with the goodness of the Lord. And of course, as we end, we realize here, Paul had his, his, uh, his fellowship in verse uh, 14 and 15 and 16. He says the Philippians were his partners together. He says no church shared, the word shared is the word Koinonia. They were in partnership with him in the things of the Lord. And uh, it's interesting that sometimes if you find as a businessman, you find in a ministry, you find in your professional work, you find as your, your housewife, whatever areas, you find that yourself cannot 
you need a help extra, be humble enough to join hands with someone and ask for prayer. Humility is important. And then you join and you pray along and find people. Look at what the world is made up of. Somebody invented, you know, partnerships out there. Somebody invented companies which share. Why? Because one person doesn't have enough resources, but then a hundred people, they have resources. And of course, we realize not everybody can be partnership because sometimes people have different uh, vision, different dreams, different, different methods and all this clash. But it depends on how you structure it. They need not be, you know, in, in that, that level, but you could have a contractual relationship or perhaps a spiritual relationship in some manner. Paul had a spiritual relationship with the Philippian, he called it a koinonia relationship. The word koinonia, by the way, is used in the Gospel of Luke chapter 6 to talk about the partnership of uh, Peter, James, and John, uh, uh, and Andrew. And all of they were in partnership together in the fishing business. Koinonia. So koinonia involves spiritual partnership. It involves business partnership, as you saw in Luke chapter 6. It involves all kinds of partnership. And the most important partnership is God choose the people. They could pray together carefully. It's important uh, in those areas. Although finding Christian partners is one of the hardest, and sometimes Christian partners, uh, no, uh, they are okay when they start, but when things grow big, people change. So it's important for us to realize that however you structure everything, it's important that the spiritual level remains the most uh, crucial and the most important. And uh, so sometimes, like King Solomon, he has a relationship and a partnership uh, to build the temple of God. Do you realize that the temple of Solomon was built not just by believers? Solomon had a contractual relationship with King Hiram, who supplied with him all the skillful people because they were the most skillful people. King Hiram loved God, loved David, but I don't think he was a worshiper of Jehovah. Uh, he, I mean, he, he respected God not in that sense. Uh, respected David, good friend of David. But he, King Hiram, if you read the tradition, he had his own religion and his own culture. And then there were all the thousands of laborers. And so it's important for us to understand it's just a matter, again, wisdom. There is a gift of administration. We, if people tap on, one can chase a thousand. Two joined together properly can chase 10,000. And that continued. Three, 100,000. And that continued to explode, which is, in, which is powerful. And uh, sometimes people have to be purified and people have to be tested and all those things. But when you have fine people of the vision, people of the same heart, cooperating together, you can build a great thing. Think about the American nation. United States. Although we, we are seeing the uh, United States uh, losing a lot of its influence and world power, but imagine for 200 years it had been the bulwark of the most powerful nation of the world. And what was the nation made up of? A government for the people of the, uh, a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Powerful concept, isn't it? And just a group of, of, of people coming together, drafting out a constitution that could bind a group of people which so diverse into a powerful nation that has lasted at least for 200 years. It's powerful what when people come together, even God acknowledged that in the Tower of Babel, that if the people bind together, what would stop them? God knows the power of unity. And so it's important for us to understand. It all takes wisdom. And when wisdom comes together, and it's how you structure everything together, powerful things can happen. Imagine, the Philippian church and Paul in partnership. And Paul says, even in Thessalonica, it was the support 
of the Philippians that continue the gospel. Powerful ministry. So we don't see the behind the scene. I'm sure they will have their reward in heaven. And as we close in this book of Philippians, we see here that it leaves us with the principle of prosperity. But a prosperity that is not selfish. A prosperity that is willing to go hungry. Amazing. A prosperity that is not ashamed. You know, you got to give great blessing, fine. It's also not ashamed. But a prosperity that is balanced. A prosperity that doesn't complain even when there's a need. A prosperity that knows how to go without and to go with much. A prosperity that knows how to go to the valley and knows how to live on the mountaintop. A prosperity that is balanced in every manner. God supplies all our needs according to His riches in glory. So tonight, as we close, we're going to pray for this wisdom of God the revelation of the riches of God's glory. Let's all go to God in prayer. Let's pray in the Spirit first as we tap upon this wonderful grace of His glory. Aria chala bache ke bariya chala bache ke bariya chala bache kala babariya chala bash. Aria tiriya nala masha nala mama Maria tiriya tiriya chala bash nala baba bash. Aria chala mama sheriya chala mama bariya tiriya chala babariya chala bash. Aria tiriya nala maholiya neriya na. Shama Baba Shikimirian Tirian Tilian Dalamash, Shanian Dalamash, Orian Alamba Marian Tirian Tirian Telamash Nalamash, Amaria So Orian Elia Tilia Telamash, Orian Tiria Oliania Tolamash. Shana, <laughs> Oriya tiriya 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 nala mash nala ma mash na Oriya so hozana la hozana Aliya shiriya ta We 
magnify your name, Lord. We magnify your name, Lord. We glorify your name, Lord. Open down the windows of heaven, Lord. Open down. Oh, <laughs> Oh Father, even tonight we ask for the spirit of wisdom. All the riches of the glory in Christ Jesus to be deposited into our hearts and our minds tonight. And even those who are hearing this word, oh Father. Oh Father, what we ask for to supply our needs is not a natural force, but a spiritual force. A spiritual force of righteousness, a spiritual force of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. That will teach us what to do, where to go, how to do it. And the teachers, oh God, Put to be in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing with the right heart. Oh Father, you have said, Lord, that we shall be the head and not the tail. And we believe that word with all our hearts. We shall indeed be the head and not the tail. And your word says that we shall land and we shall not borrow. Which means that, Lord, we will be the richest in the world because we are the children of the Lord. But not in the wrong way, Father. But because we have a great and a mighty God who can supply every need according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Father, we know that that supply will only come when we have the right heart and the right attitude. And then we are in the right place in the right time, doing the right thing. Father, only your wisdom in us can help us to get all these things right. So we ask, oh God, especially for impartation of your spirit of wisdom. Wisdom because we know, Father God, it takes prosperity to preach your gospel throughout the whole earth. It takes prosperity, oh God, to plant churches all over the world. It takes prosperity, Father God, to reach the nations that are poor. It takes prosperity to feed the orphans and the widows. It takes prosperity, Father, to be hospitals that can bring healing to people both in the spiritual, in the soul, and in the natural. Combining, oh God, spiritual healing and natural healing. And Father, we know these are our dreams that we present to you. These are our visions that your Spirit inspire in us. And we believe it is possible. And we believe it is achievable in our lifetime. We don't need a hundred lives. We just need one life. We just need sufficient lives to live for you. We know, Father God, that to do your will Money is never the problem. Never the problem. We thank you, Father. We can do your will. And we set our hearts right in you to do your will. We desire, Father God, to establish 24-hour worship, 24-hour prayer. Desire, oh God, to plant churches all over in all the nations of the world.
desire, O oh Lord, to build hospitals to bring healing, both spiritual healing and natural healing. A desire, O oh Lord, to help people heal of sickness and disease, to fund research, O oh God, in the natural and in the spiritual. Oh Father God, to build orphanages, to feed the widows, to feed the poor, to help eliminate poverty, to help those in need, oh God, to finance people who have the right vision in the business world, to do many, many things. Oh God. Father, we thank you. All these are good desires and good dreams. And among your people here, there are many more dreams and visions. And Father, we know all things are possible to those who believe. And we believe it with all our hearts. And so, Father, from this day forward, grant your people, grant each one of us a measure of your wisdom. Tonight, we receive that, Lord. Receive your wisdom. Wisdom into our heart. Wisdom abundant. Wisdom supernal. Wisdom of Christ upon our spirit, soul, and body. The same Christ who can find gold in the mouth of a fish. The same wisdom that will tell us where the finances supply are. Thank you, Father God. And we line our hearts with your hearts, oh God. And we ask, oh God, that as you begin to bless us in all these wonderful ways, Koreans nalaki kumbats niantush. Yea, I have spoken in my word and I declare, and my angels have gone forth, that they will supply all your needs. For it is my desire that the people who follow me, the people who are my sheep, who follow after the sheep, shepherd, shall not want, shall have all their needs supplied. Have I not spoken from the beginning that I will bring them into green pastures and make them lie down beside still waters? Have I not said that the difficulty that you have is nothing to fear? For have not my word declared that I will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies? So do not fear, my children, when you go through the valley of the shadow of death. Do not fear when you walk to places that are difficult. For I am ahead of you. I have prepared, say of the Lord. I have prepared, say of the Lord, a table for you, even in the presence of your enemies. And you will eat and shall be full. And more than that, I will cause my goodness and mercy to follow you all the days of your life. For this is the heritage of my people. And I will be your God. And you will be my people. And I will establish my covenant with you. I will multiply you. I will spread you as I cause Abraham's seed to multiply. So will I cause you to be like the stars in the heaven. So stand forth my people. Stand for my servants, for you are the seed of Abraham. And through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Thank you, Father. We receive your blessing. We receive your impartation. And we, we agree with your word. We are the seed of Abraham. And the true words, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And we will remember that, Lord. And when we are blessed, it's not just for ourselves. It's that all the families of the earth will be blessed through our lives. For we do not want just us to be blessed. For it will mean nothing if we are so blessed and all around us is poverty. But we want to be so blessed that the blessing flow through us until all the families of the earth are blessed. Then there is equality. That's the blessing we want, oh God. That when we prosper, all will prosper with us. We thank you, Lord. Until we can eliminate poverty. 
eliminate suffering. Oh, Father, we thank you that this is the glorious church. That is what you have destined for us to inherit of the fullness of Christ. So seal this for Father God in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's give Jesus a good clap offering. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you. Amen. And uh, the Lord bless you. And uh, have a good night. And tomorrow, remember, there's all night prayer. There's, of course, the afternoon service for those of you who are coming. And uh, then the all night prayer. Prepare yourselves. And uh, we're going to have a wonderful time of, in the face of the Lord.